Hello Booktube, it's the beginning of June and um, time to get in a, a May wrap up, my delights, discoveries and any disappointments in, 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 in my reading in May. In fact there weren't really any disappointments, I read, I finished 15 books which was almost too many because I'm not sure I had enough time to relish all of them to the full but um, uh, that was partly perhaps because I was taking part in sort of six different readathony things and a couple of read-alongs and or group reads and one one sort of individual buddy read and that's probably too much and I need to sort of scale things back a bit so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to kind of group things like fiction in English or non-fiction or you know and um, uh, say which was the best in in those categories so a slightly different way of doing it this month and I'm going to start with the best non-fiction because that's a nice easy one because I only read two books of non-fiction one of them was actually um, non-fiction um, comic you know graphic um, and it was uh, the graphic uh, a kind of autobiographical graphic novel called Face by Rosario um, Villajos um, she's Spanish she now lives in London it came out in 2017 it was a good graphic novel in that the visual element was key to the book, to the book working, uh, as it were. It's it's uh, her, yes, it's autobiographical, but it's about her as a woman who, who feels, believes, sees herself as having no face you know, just a featureless sort of empty space. I mean, she doesn't, can't really have no space because we see her eat and drink and see things and hear things and talk to people, but, you know, blank canvas for, for where her face should be. And um, she really kind of, she explores that in the book and she has a relationship with a woman and ends up taking on the face of the woman and she has a relationship with the man and the man starts to lose his face um, more like her, uh, which makes him run away. And so you can see it's a book about kind of identity and self-image. It's good, but not brilliant because it was a bit of a one trip pony. You know, there was really one idea in the book. And so, yeah, uh, maybe only three stars, but but not bad, not bad by any means. But my other nonfiction book was a big win. Um, and that was this one, Rachel Carson, um, Under the Sea Wind. And I would describe this as a discovery, except that Rachel Carson, I feel, is is, uh, is well known to me, but I've never actually read a whole book by her before, even though I know of her so very much. And this was actually her first book. Um, so it came out in 1941, um, which makes it part of my May of the Moderns reading, reading because um, that was a big, a big element in May for me, um, that reading books published between 1901 and 1945 as organised by Margaret Pinard. So it, what's this book like? What's this book like? It's 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 a nature book, an ecology book. It, 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 I think it's it was quite new in style at the time. Um, and was Rachel Carson feeling her way? And and you know we eventually got the Silent Spring, which was her kind of absolute. You know, was uh, it's described as a pivotal book of the twentieth century in terms of how we think about the environment and our human impact upon it. In this one, you can see what she's trying to do is get her readers to see um, see the sea um, uh, as a, a sort of ecological whole and to do that she follows three different creatures a, 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 a wader a sanderling a mackerel and an eel through their sort of life cycle um and almost kind of like anthropomorphizes them a bit which would be something that would turn me off normally but but it's 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 done with such understanding of um the science involved I suppose that it, it didn't annoy me and on the contrary it's like she really successfully takes you under the the surface of the water in a way that humans can't see yeah definitely definitely a win so that was non-fiction it was quite mesmerizing prose actually that's what I would say mm. next group I'm going to talk about is is best fiction written in English um and I read how many? Let's think five. Five novels um, 
originally written in English, all of which were good and some of which were absolutely right up there for me, top, top rate. I'm going to start with the weakest of the five, which is not to say it's not a good book, and that was Homegoing by Yar Gayasi. Now, I read that for Katie of Books and Things, um, historical fiction, uh, read along, uh, readathon this, in May, and it was a book that I've been meaning to read for ages, so I was using the, the, the readathon as, as, as that extra nudge to get to read it, because it's been so, um, I've heard so many people enthused about it, and it is a really impressive achievement. It's a debut novel, um, Gayasi is Ghanaian American. What she does is she kind of creates, I think I, I might describe it as like a daisy chain of stories. You know, she starts with two sisters in Ghana in the 18th century and she follows their descendants in Ghana and in America in, in sort of parallel lines um, until it, the lines ultimately kind of recross um, in a way at the end so what an achievement what a what a what a um i don't know a, a bold undertaking some of it was superb it weakened towards the end for me the more modern it got the less successful it was for me but i know some people absolutely you know it was a real five-star book for some people but just not quite for me maybe because it was a bit too too much like short stories which are not my thing i don't know mm, yeah i have to think about that Next brilliant book of fiction in English that I read, wonderful novel, was um, In This House of Breed by Rumor Gordon, um, 1969, I think that came out. That was I read that for maybe Midrash, the um, like read something with a religious theme, and loved it. But I made a, it's inspired me to make a whole video about books about nuns, novels about nuns. So I'll say nothing more about it here. Now the next two I'm going to talk about are two novels by two of my absolute favourite current British writers, current British novelists, um, Ali Smith and John McGregor. Um, they're quite different, but they both write what I suppose you'd describe as literary fiction. You know, it, it quite, uh, you know, a bit unconventional, a bit something, you know, with an emphasis, I suppose, on style and um, quality of writing. No, not that plot and character are ignored, but, you know, it, they're, they're attempting a little something extra beyond just tell a good story. Lean Full Stand, is that right? Yes, that's right, um, by John McGregor. It came out in 2021, and I've been meaning to read it ever since it came out, because I've read, I think I've actually, he's one of those few writers where I've read everything that he's published, I think. Um, it's It's typical of him in that... You think you're getting one thing at the start of the novel and you end up getting something else. Um, Reservoir 13, which is probably my favourite book of his, you know, you begin, it begins with the sort of disappearance of a child and what you expect you're going to get is a resolution of the disappearance of that child. And instead what you, instead what you get is like a kind of portrait of a community um, in the following years. This one, the first section, Lean, is a, a quite melodramatic um catastrophe within, the, within the, the, an Antarctic um, expedition but then what you get in the other two sections is um, a, an examination of what it means to become a carer and what that does to a couple you know uh, um, you know husband and wife if, when when one becomes disabled and the other becomes carer how that changes their relationship and then and then the third section is I suppose about living with living with having had a stroke and 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 recovering some of your sense of self. It's about the stories, the, how the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves make us who we are. Um, I read it in a day and I think that may be the best way to read it and um, was yeah consumed by it. I think having cared for someone who's had a stroke may have added something to the quality of the book for me, but it was a, you know, five-star read. I also read the next one in the space of a day um, because I couldn't put it down and what a treat it was. I kind of actually chose a day when I knew I'd be able to do that if I wanted to because I love this writer so much. And that's Ali Smith's companion piece. Now, this is sort of grew out of her quartet, seasonal quartet. Um, so it's linked to those, but not in terms of character, more sort of thematically, I suppose. Um, wonderful, wonderful, just wonderful. It's, it's 
starts out as seemingly quite a simple story about an artist whose father's in hospital. It's written in the time of COVID. It, it is, I suppose, yeah, it's a COVID pandemic novel, but it's much more timeless than that would suggest, calling it that. Um, as I say, it starts simple and then it gets stranger. Um, it, a sort of one of the, the artist's sort of ex-acquaintances gets in touch and she becomes kind of in a weird way embroiled with that woman's family and then we go off into the the middle ages and we meet this female apprentice blacksmith um who seems to perhaps time travel and is that real and isn't it you know it it's for a short novel it packs a lot in i think it's really kind of like a meditation on connection between people and companionship hence companion peace but the absolute magic is in the words I mean Ali Smith is just is what she does with language that makes her fiction just that cut above well now if what else could I have read in terms of in English fiction that would compete with 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 that well, as I say, it was made of the moderns, so that was as good an excuse as any to pick up another um, novel by Virginia Woolf, and one that I've never read. And I read this one, Jacob's Room, which was published in 1922. Uh, so, in fact, exactly 100 years before this. <laughs> now, this was Woolf's third novel I think but it's really the first where she kind of comes into her own as a as a modernist novelist uh, I think and um it's it's not her best um but the thing is is that a sort of I don't know second tier novel by Wolf is as good as anything you're going to read by anyone writing since or today that's my opinion I think it's puzzled some people as a novel because you know it's about Jacob and you you might come to it expecting to get to know Jacob and hear about Jacob and in a weird way you don't in fact what you what you learn about is Jacob's room metaphorically speaking because you you hear all about his his surroundings that everything in his life other than him it's like he's the empty space in the middle of it um there, you know, you, you see, you know, where he lives and the people he interacts with, his family, his friends, his, the, his fellow students when he's a student, yeah, his, his environment, eh, oh, his tra when he goes abroad, the other travellers that he meets. But we're never in, we're never really in Jacob's head. And I think that's probably a bit off-putting for some readers. I don't know, but I, 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 I have to say, I, I really, I really did love it. I, it has um, uh, one of the most moving endings uh, that I've read, I think. Um, at the end of the novel, we see Jacob's mother, his, his widowed mother, who's been around, you know, from the very beginning of the story. Um, and his kind of his best friend, Bonamy, who's, um, who was essentially... Um, in love with Jacob all the way through the book, Bonamy, and never gets to fully express that. And the two of them, Jacob's mother and his sort of gay best friend, are are packing up and getting rid of and dealing with his things. And what you realise is that um, Jacob must have died and died fighting in the First World War, but that's never explicitly said. But the way the book ends, I'm just going to read you the last couple of lines because um, so you could imagine his 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 room. He left everything just as it was. Bonamy marvelled. Nothing arranged. All his letters strewn about for anyone to read. What did he expect? Did he think he would come back? He mused, standing in the middle of Jacob's room. And then you hear more about the room and the the hustle and bustle outside the room. And then um, uh, Bonamy is, is is looking out of the window. Um, Jacob, Jacob cried Bonamy, standing by the window. The leaves sank down again. Such confusion everywhere, exclaimed Betty Flanders, Jacob's mother, bursting open the bedroom door. Bonamy turned away from the window. What am I to do with these, Mr Bonamy? 
she held out a pair of Jacob's old shoes. It's enough to make me cry, isn't it? There you go. So, let's move on though, clearing the tears from, that, from our eyes, um, to Best Drama of the Month. Now, this is a real frustration. Okay, so Tilly and I read two plays by the Ukrainian playwright, uh, Natalia Vorospit, and she and I made a video about the, 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 the best of the two of them, um, the grain store, which is about a famine in Ukraine in, in, in Stalin's time, and a wonderful play. We made, really enjoyed making our, our discussion video on Zoom, and then it went, poof, it disappeared. And due to circumstances, she and I haven't been able to re-record it, so um, that's to come. I won't say anything more about that. Let's move on to best poetry. So, I read two books of poetry this month, or read all of one and finished the other. Now, this one, Scars Upon My Heart, is a collection of women's poetry and verse from the First World War. So, this was read, again, for May of the Moderns. Patchy, I would say. There's some real, there's some real little gems in here. I mean, it, you know, it's by a multitude of different um, women writers. Um, some of which kind of were participants in the war in the sense of they were nurses or whatever, and some were more like observers or or the 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 women left behind or the women holding the fort at home and 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 uh, some of it was a bit twee, some of it was a bit jingoistic. It was it was collected to sort of be a representative sample, I suppose, and not necessarily brilliant poetry. But I was glad to read it. This was a very different animal. Now I've mentioned off and on over the past few months that I've been reading. I was buddy reading this with Kate Howe, and it's a novel-length po poem in verse by Robert Brown, a Victorian poet. Um, it was sort of published complete in, in 1869, I think. Um, it's a real oddity, I have to say. I, I, Kate and I really enjoyed reading it together, and we both really enjoyed the poem. But it's, it's based on a, a 17th century Italian murder trial, and... Um, why exactly Browning chose to write a kind of full-length epic poem about this murder trial is, is, well, almost your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I think because it was a, a, a it, it intrigued him, and then it became a vehicle to, um, I don't know, explore human, human nature, human motivation, good and evil. You know, um, we get you get a series of dramatic monologues, some of which are more fun than others. Uh, it's. An interesting experience, not necessarily one I would um, recommend unless you're, you've got a kind of high tolerance threshold for um, long Victorian poetry. But if you have, it's a, it, it's, it's a gem, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was good. Just a challenge, I suppose. So last group, last thing for, you know, what were my, what were my delights? And actually this is translated fiction and Four different books, all of which were delights, you know, all of which were, 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 were a real pleasure to read. Um, so two of these I read for Lit with Indian Lit, which is um, comes around each year. So one to watch out for. It's um, a readathon encouraging us to read Indian literature um, in translation. So Indian literature written in one of the multitude of, of Indian languages rather than that which is written in English, which of course quite a bit of Indian literature is. One of those was a, a they're both backlist. One of them was a May of the Moderns choice, and one was a bit more recent from the 1960s. I'll start with that one. That was 55 Pillars Red Walls um, by Usha uh, Premvada. Uh, came out in 1961. It was translated in 2021 by um, from the Hindi by Daisy Rockwell. Now, interestingly, um, Daisy Rockwell's translation of Tomb of Sand just won the um, Booker Prize International. So um, if you've heard her name, that could be why. Really good translation. It's quite a simple, short, but rather touching um, book about a, a young college lecturer who, who's, who's essentially resigned to supporting her, her family. And so she's educated, she's financially independent, she's um, edging towards sexual liberation, um, but she's still controlled by forces of duty and convention. Um, it's quite 
sad in 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 a sense, but a, a lovely a lovely little book. Um, uh, definitely a recommendation. Second one was Devdas by Sarat Chandra Chattopadhyay, and that was originally published in 1917 in Bengali. Um, I read a translation by Vishwanath Navaran. This was an interesting read. Okay, um, uh, Sarat Chandra is kind of a, was a contemporary and friend of, of Rabindranath Tagore, who's perhaps a sort of better known figure of the Bengali Renaissance. But it, it was a, a period of like you know, uh, I don't know, a really positive choice to write in Bengali, which was interesting in the context of, I don't know, the beginning of the 20th century, the, um, you know, what was happening in, in British India then, um, the, the Indian sort of uh, nationalist movement developing and so on. So that was interesting context. The story itself is about a pair of childhood friends and who whose friendship sort of evolves into love, um, Devdas and Paro, or Paramjit. Uh, it's Devdas is an interesting character. He's quite violent, quite to, to a modern British reader. He's quite an unpleasant character in his sort of I don't know sense of entitlement as a boy and a, and, a, and a man, and yet he seems to be. Quite charismatic uh, in 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 terms of how he's perceived by other people in the book. So that's a kind of interesting, I don't know, cultural difference to to get to grips with. Class differences and uh, Devdas's weakness of character really mean that this this love affair is uh, ends unhappily. They 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 don't get to marry. He he becomes quite dissolute, um, living in Calcutta. Um, and so it's a, it's a, there's a, it's a sort of like a romantic tragedy in a sense, although Paro makes, makes a life for herself in, he makes independent choices that, 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 um, yeah, get a security at least. I think it's quite typical of his work in that it's set in rural Bengal and it's really, you know, about the, about, he liked to write about the life, the struggles of, 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 of. Of, of villagers, you know, as opposed to a sort of urban elite or, um, you know, and um, it's a book which has been, I, I believe, the most popular, most translated, most adapted, most plagiarised of um, Indian novels ever, you know, that's, that's what, that's what we're told. It's really interesting that um, Sarat Chandra is such a a, a very incredibly popular um, novelist in India um, or in, you know, the Indian subcontinent and very little known here and very little translated. This translation I read was not a brilliant translation. Um, you know, I think he probably deserves better. Um, but yes, so a worthwhile read, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it or certainly not in the translation that I read. Whereas last two books I'm going to talk about were absolutely superb translations. One was Disoriental by uh, Nagar Javadi. It was translated by Tina Kova. Um, so it was written in 2016 in French and translated in 2018. It's a first novel by uh, uh, an a, a Iranian-French um, author. She's a screenwriter. She's a filmmaker. You know, better known for that. It feels sort of semi-autobiographical. I mean, it's based on her own experiences as someone who uh, had grew up in Iran, had a politically um, dissident um, parents and ends up having to, to flee and, you know, after, after the revolution, sometime after the revolution, and ends up in, in living in France as an exile, you know. And that's true of both the main character and of um, Jabadi herself. Having said that, it's it's... It's, it is a novel, it's not memoir, it's rich, it's complex, it's non-linear. Um, uh, the non-linearity worked well for me, um, but I don't know if it would for everyone. It's like the first, I don't know, good half of the novel is all, um, she's in the waiting room of a fertility clinic in Paris, and as she's waiting, she's sort of thinking back almost how she got there, and so we get her family history and her history all jumbled up a sort of in 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 sort of a slightly non-sequential order but so so much about um you know 
20th century Iran and the 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 dramatic I mean like her her great grandmother is born in a kind of um a, a harem in effect you know um you know one daughter of one of sort of 20 wives or whatever and 60 children I don't know and she is you know uh, grows up in a in in a Iran that was radically changing and um then changes again with the revolution and the com coming of you know Ayatollah Khomeini in 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 1979 so so you know what a dramatic backdrop for a novel it's it, i would say in a sense that disjointed structure um almost it almost mirrors her disorientation um which again is reflected in the title i guess you know as uh, someone who's plucked out of one life well has one life as a child and then you have the um uh revolution so life changes again and then the you know emigration and being a um a, a newcomer in a different society so all of that is is disorientating and her relationship with her parents and being sucked away from her uncles and grandparents grandmother who was so important in her life and you know, all of that it's also she's also disorientalized i suppose by you know to what extent she discards her iranian self and becomes um and yet doesn't comfortably become french or or, or and she kind of almost tries out being european rather than french and and it, ooh, i could go on about this book for too long really um and i will stop but um i will just say that i read it for the lgbtq um in fiction in translation no book, book books in translation um reading group which i highly recommend and um it, that's carrying on it so um do join it if you fancy and um yeah definitely a, a, that was a five star five star book for me so final book to talk about in this month and i've saved this one for last because in some ways it was the the most it felt like the most significant read of the month for me um Although um, I only read a bit of it in this month because most of it I read in um, uh, the month before um, because it was Magic Mountain by uh, Thomas Mann. So long, slow read um, with a great group of people. It was translated by from the German by Edith Grossman. Um, I've forgotten the date of the translation, but the book originally was published in 1924. And uh, note the date because, again, there was a May of Moderns link. Um, but Mann began this book before the First World War and then finished it and published it afterwards and that is key to um, The Magic Mountain because World War One kind of looms over the story. It takes place in the sort of um, years running up to the war and it's the story of Hans Kastorp who's a sort of German everyman figure, um, comfortably off, you know, not a, not a you know, working class, a, a kind of upper class, but but a kind of, I don't know, an almost a mediocre person, you know, a, um, a bit unattached, you know, he, he's an orphan, he has uncles that, and great uncles that kind of bring him up, but he's, he's yes, he's almost like a lone, a bit of a lone figure, and he comes to a sanatorium in the Alps to visit his cousin um, for three weeks, and and never manages to leave or not until very close to the end of the novel so he it's like he sort of slips into this sort of um hiatus this non-life um in the sanatorium almost avoiding um getting to grips with um the world below and that's how he stays until the war comes basically now this is a very complex book it it in a sense, is a commentary on the kind of, I don't know, almost parasitical life of the European bourgeoisie at the end of the 19th, early in the early 20th century. It's, um, and almost the way Europe was sleepwalking into a disastrous war. He uses characters in the book to kind of expound, I don't know, political and philosophical ideas that obviously interest him. That makes it sound quite a dull book and it is absolutely not for a long book it was really engaging why why i mean the ideas are actually interesting um but really the characters it's the characters that hold you it's that um 
you know, when I was talking about books about in my video about nuns, it's that closed world. In so you get a kind of in, real um, uh, the interactions of these kind of small group of, of of characters that are bound together by the community that they're living in, and even if they they might not have chosen each other as as to be so to live with. Um, Hans's development is interesting. His development as a person, sort of intellectually and emotionally. It's got a love story of sorts in there. Um, it's got a lot of humour, a lot of very funny incidents. It has overwhelmingly beautiful prose and some really quite visionary sections. So if you've ever wondered, could I stomach reading that big fat German classic? Yes, yes, you could. But I have to say that I was carried along even better by by the lovely group of people who I shared it with on Voxer so um thank you to all of that group and that was my that was my reading in May I hope you had a brilliant May and um I hope you'll tell me about it in the comments or if you've read any of these these books too and um roll on uh flaming June <laughs>